Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 4th of June 2014. My name is Total Biscuit with your viewer Q&A. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com, and that's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is the remainder of the match I played in Dawngate as the King of Masks. The last mailbox, when was that? That oh, was two weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, you probably noticed there's been less videos than usual. I apologize for that. If you don't already know, I, I did do a video on it some time ago, but now I know for sure that I have cancer, basically, and I'm having to deal with various procedures and nonsense, and I'll be starting chemo very shortly. So there will most likely be times when there's maybe a couple of days where I don't have any videos or anything like that, but I intend to keep working because, frankly, it's what I love doing, and... I think focusing on this will certainly help my mindset. Regardless, let's get past the depressing stuff and get on to more depressing stuff. Because welcome to video games. We have an industry that tends to screw up a lot. So if you want depressing, then we've got plenty of that. This email comes in from Billy Glansby and says, Recently, with the announced revitalization of the Rise of Nations franchise, it has come to thought that such processes are common in the industry. As a lover of the RON franchise, I find it appealing that Microsoft has breathed new life into what was at least in my opinion, the best RTS in gaming. What are your thoughts on such matters? One could assume bringing back flagship titles from genres which have struggled as of late would only bring competition to the franchise, cite the Age of Empires 2 and Rise of Nations battle, uh, which in any case would uh, further push innovation in the genre and as a result bring back what was once the golden age of RTS games. In another sense, it could be seen as the revitalization of such franchises as a quick cash-and-run attempt. The Rise of Nations and Rise of Legends acquisitions were sold for a total of $320,000 to Microsoft, who understandably could see a huge margin for a quick piece of profit. I happen to be one of the idiots who have pre-purchased these games simply for the love of the franchise, and the online matchmaking system which will be implemented. Where do you stand on such matters? Do you, does this hinder gaming or push a huge stride towards innovation? And frankly, I don't think it does either. I feel that there is a space in the market for re-releases, and I don't personally have too much of a problem with them. The issue that I have is when they don't do them very well. Most of these HD remakes pop up on consoles for obvious reasons, because most games on PC will run at an HD-like resolution, even if they're pretty old. But one of the recent examples would be Age of Empires 2 Enhanced Edition. Not a very good upgrade, especially not for the price. It was criticized for not really offering all that much new. It was also very buggy, still, which is ludicrous. And the online matchmaking didn't work anywhere near as well as people had hoped. The upgrades that the game had actually received were few and far between. And as a result, it was criticized. And frankly, you know, it was a $20 HD edition. So I suppose it's not particularly surprising. And then we had Age of Mythology Enhanced Edition. Now, they actually made more of an effort to improve the graphical fidelity on that one, but they also gave an additional boost to the price tag, $30 for that game. Was it worthwhile? I don't think it has anywhere near enough upgrades to justify the $30 price tag. I'm sorry, but when I'm buying older titles, I'm usually getting them from GOG, and I expect a price line of about $10. Sometimes more like 6 or 7 But yeah, about $10 for an older release that works just fine on new platforms. If I want to get Dungeon Keeper 2, I can play it for $6. Alpha Centauri, $6. If I want to get Heroes of Might and Magic 3 complete with both the expansions, that's $10. There's a lot of examples of titles on GOG that are very reasonably priced. And if I'm going to pay three times that, sometimes up to six times that, for a supposedly upgraded modern version of an older title, I expect upgrades and I expect it to be dragged kicking and screaming into the modern age. And frankly, Age of Mythology does not do that, and neither does Age of Empires 2 HD. It comes down to level of expectation. What do we expect from a re-release, especially if they're going to be charging that kind of money for it. On console, it's a bit easier to figure out because usually they're re-releases of games that were on the PS2 or in some cases the PS1. And an upgrade for PS3 or PS4 is usually pretty obvious. It will at least be upscaled at the bare minimum. So you're getting that resolution boost. Sometimes you get a frame rate boost up to 60 if they didn't have that previously. You often get a lot of content bundled into it. And in the case of something like Final Fantasy X Remastered, the difference is very, very obvious. They have done a lot to make that game look better. 
And not to mention that it's a pretty good value proposition considering they put Final Fantasy X-2 in there as well. Admittedly, you're also looking at a little bit of a pricier proposition unless you pick it up on Vita, for instance, where it's about $30, which is exactly how much they are charging for Age of Mythology Extended Edition or Enhanced Edition or whatever the heck you want to call it, which does come with the expansion pack, absolutely. But does it really have enough to justify the price tag. That's a very subjective opinion. Some people just want to play Age of Mythology again, and they're willing to pay for the convenience of having the bloody thing work right out of the box on a modern OS, instead of having to dig back into Age of Empires Gold or the Gold Edition of Age of Mythology, which can be acquired from various places, and potentially having to deal with some weirdness. Maybe the resolution's just not quite right. It's in 4x3 or something along those lines. Maybe they just don't want to mod it in order to fix some of the problems and they want multiplayer that actually works. And of course, things like Steam Workshop support are very valuable as well. Things like cloud saves are nice. Most of the stuff like enhanced observer mode and Twitch integration, not, not exactly all that important to the vast majority of people. And then there are people that actually do expect more, and I'm definitely one of those, honestly. Uh, when I see what GOG does with their titles, and then I compare it to the price tag that's attached to some of these extended or enhanced editions, I don't find the increase in price to be justifiable. It does not look that good, and even if you do polish up the graphical fidelity of the game, maybe you put on some things like bump mapping, new lighting effects, AA and ambient occlusion, better shadows, that doesn't fix the animation quality, yeah? The units still look pretty bad and they still move in a clunky fashion because that's what a lot of old school RTS did. So it seems to me like all you're doing is giving it a fresh coat of paint and claiming it's new. And that's the real problem I've got with it. It's more of a polish up. It's the kind of thing that could be done with a mod. And yet there's a lot of money being charged for it. That said, I don't mind the practice. I just wish they would do it better. The fact that Rise of Nations is coming back and will be compatible with new machines. It's priced at $20 or $16, I think, if you pre-order the thing and has the expansion with it, as well as perhaps most importantly, functional multiplayer with Steam and ranked matches, it's probably worth it. It's still a good game, and I don't think you can really argue against that. It's just I would always like to hold developers to a higher standard when they're re-releasing the same game. It's like, oh, you want me to pay for a game that originally came out 10 years ago? Okay, well, show me that you've done something with it that's worthy of that. Because otherwise, if you're pulling a GOG, but you're charging three times as much, then I'm going to call foul on it. Now, does releasing these games actually have any effect on the genre? You mentioned that bringing back old RTS might stimulate new RTS. I think the only thing it really does is prove that there is interest in the genre, but really, there's always been interest in it. It's just that, for the longest time, the audience moved off to console where RTS doesn't really work, and as a result, a lot of the bigger developers and publishers that were making RTS previous to this didn't want to do it anymore, because they didn't really see the value, they didn't see the money in it. But I'm not 100% convinced that bringing these games back will give a big push to developers to innovate and revitalize the genre, because really you're bringing back mechanics and you're bringing back games and ideas and design philosophies from 10 years ago. Whereas what we should be looking forward to is real-time strategy that actually takes some risks and changes things up a bit. And really, the only game in town right now is StarCraft 2, if you want a competitive RTS, with Company of Heroes 2 kind of trailing behind that in a really big way. It's almost like the same problem we have with MMOs, that MMOs want to be sufficiently different from WoW to draw people away, but they don't want to be too different from WoW, because if they are, then they won't attract the audience. And honestly, you know, you should be aping WoW's formula, because that was the successful formula, right? At least that's what they believe. So I'm not convinced that it actually makes any difference whatsoever to the industry, but it does give more active choices to consumers if they wish to play a genre, even if it does involve revisiting something that was made 10 years ago with a fresh coat of paint. This one comes in from John Stanley that says, Early access and paid alphas and betas have obviously been getting a lot of ire from gamers lately, but something that's been bothering me for a while that never seems to get mentioned is a functional cash 
item store or microtransaction system in beta builds. The most recent example of this is the Magicka Wizard Wars open beta, where I was delighted, I assume that's sarcastic, to see that the store was chock full of staffs and robes for me to spend real money on. I also noticed this a while back during the Mighty Quest for Epic Loot beta. I believe the open beta for Planetside 2, but that was a long time ago, and I can't remember, as well as numerous others. Isn't this bullshit? If you want to release a beta, why should there be a cash item store when in reality you should be giving those items for free to beta players that actually test things like balance? In the case of Magicka, the items are not just customizations and have actual effects on gameplay. Are companies ensuring players won't lose these items or get them changed? It seems uh, pretty shitty to release a game as beta for testing or whatever so they can write off things like imbalance and bugs and glitches, but you bet your ass that real money item shops are up and running. It's been happening for a while now, and I'm kind of amazed to see that it hasn't been discussed anywhere. Maybe my outrage is misplaced. I don't think your outrage is misplaced, but what I do think is misplaced is the term beta. It is fucking meaningless now. And that bothers me, because for a very, very long time, I was proponent of beta is beta. I would excuse pretty much any game as long as it was in beta, but once it reached its release date, if that problem was still there, you bet your ass that I would absolutely rip it to shreds. Right now, it seems like we have entered a stage of the industry where companies wish to eschew all responsibility for any problems that the game actually has. And unfortunately, many people are very willing to take up the banner and just answer the clarion call of those developers and defend it to the death. Can't criticize this because it's in beta. Can't review this, it's in beta. Can't give consumers the information they need because it's in beta and it would be unfair to make that assessment. And uh, I've said it in the past when I decided to move away from doing my Alpha Strike videos, which were the videos focused on early access games. I said this, look, I don't have the time to cover your game at every sodding patch that it goes through, especially considering it goes through ludicrous numbers of changes when there are so many finished games that are coming out in the standard fashion. Uh, I would go as far as to say the more honest way of releasing a game. I gotta give those guys my time of day and my attention. I can't mess around with your alpha beta founders build or whatever that you're charging 120 damn dollars for and yet seem to accept no responsibility whatsoever for when the bloody thing breaks. And more often than not, you have an army of fanboys willing to defend that product for whatever reason, saying it's an early access, what do you expect? So frankly, I have come to the conclusion that I have to adopt the same sort of attitude that many other actual reviewers have, which is, look, if you started charging, it's fair game. You can mention that it's not finished, absolutely, but you've started charging money for it in some way, I have got to give this information out to the consumers because they are the people that will be spending that money. They need the information. They need to be informed. Especially considering that many free-to-play games are set up in such a way that they front-load a lot of really good content, they get you in, and then you end up spending money, and then later down the line you find out that you've kind of been suckered and that there's really not much else to see. Anything that claims to be in open beta with a cash shop is not a beta anymore. Eh? It isn't. It's just released. Yeah, it is a release. If it's a release that has a lot of problems, then tough shit. You decided to release a game and you decided to charge money for it when it wasn't done. And you can make the argument that games are never done these days. And when it comes to free-to-play titles, you've got a point there. They are supposed to be titles which drive people to stick around because of content updates. That's the, that's their business model. That's what you've got to accept. You don't release a complete free-to-play game. You need to keep people coming back. So regular content updates are what drive repeat players and what drive people to then purchase microtransactions. Because what you're asking of someone is to spend real money on their video game account. And they're only going to do that if they feel that they're going to spend a lot of time with that game and that they're then committed. Once that happens, by the way, once you start committing to that account, you're more likely to continue to commit because of the sunk cost fallacy. You believe that you would lose something if you left just because you've spent money already. This is something that's kept WoW going for God knows how many years. If you offer that cash up, though, you're pretty much fair game at that point because as far as I'm concerned, that shifts you away from beta into a paid release product because the purpose of a beta is testing. It is to try and figure out what is going on and whether or not changes need to be made. 
I've said it so many times before, but back in the day, what we did for beta testing is we went and tested it. We were not charged for it. And in return, we got to play a game essentially for free for a while while providing feedback. That's the way it worked. And frankly, it worked pretty damn well. But if you are going to charge, if you're going to have a cash shop or if you're going to have a buy-in, then I think there is only one way to look at it. And that is to say that the game is a release title. It is simply unfinished. It's not a beta. It's an unfinished game. And to be fair, if you go out and play an unfinished game, well, that's up to you. As long as they didn't misrepresent the fact that it was unfinished, you kind of get what you're given there. That, at that point anyway, the consumer responsibility does kick in. You are accepting the fact that this game might not work. And you can also make the argument that, look, if you spend money in a beta, then that's kind of your fault. But the reason why it's not okay to accept that is you end up with this state of perpetual beta where they are just entirely fine trundling along under the beta tag and saying, look, you know what? Everything that's wrong with this game, it's in beta. There's nothing you can say about it and just squashing any kind of criticism. I think that there needs to be a downside to being in beta. I think that... We should not be encouraging companies to release games that are unfinished that they may never finish because that free-to-play model is very susceptible to unfinished products milking as much out of customers as possible and abandoning the title and moving on to the next one. And do we want to be rewarding that? I bloody well hope not. Last email comes in here from Chris, a.k.a. Destroyox. That sounds like a delicious beef patty. And it says this, As you most likely know, 4A Games has recently announced Metro Last Light Redux and Metro 2033 Redux and has also put them up for pre-order, giving a 50% off to the owners of the base games. I find this very questionable, as all it does is update the game with a new version of the engine and adds new game modes. Shouldn't this be just a free update for both games rather than a brand new product that costs around $13 each to the owner of the originals? I would like to hear your thoughts on the matter. Okay, let's find a middle ground. And sometimes the middle ground is not, in fact, right, as much as South Park would believe otherwise. That was a parody, they don't actually believe that. So let's look at what's actually being offered here. For Metro 2033, they've ported this thing over the last light engine, so it looks better. Yeah? We don't want to talk about an HD port when it comes to PC, because the original game was in HD in the first place and actually looked pretty damn stunning. So that's a little bit weird. But what you are seeing is a move over to the last light engine, which did run a bit better than the original engine they were running Metro 2033 on. That actually didn't run all that well, especially when you max the details out. So the Last Light engine definitely runs better. It definitely looks better. They have added in a few new styles of play to the game, a couple of different game modes. They have put Ranger mode back in, and they have made sure that it's even better. And they've put in some new sequences into the game, as well as upgraded the AI. They've put stealth takedowns in. They have put weapon customization into 2033, which, if I recall correctly, was not in it in the first place. So it seems like Metro 2033 has had the most changes. Last Light Redux, that doesn't really seem to have too much going for it outside of the kind of director's cut style of affair. Again, you've got these survival and Spartan modes. It comes with the Ranger mode that they were charging for previously. One assumes it also comes with all of the DLC that they added in the first place. But outside of that, they haven't done a huge amount to Metro Last Light. And as you mentioned, the combination of the two will set you back as about, about as much as Metro Last Light on its own would. You get that 50% discount, and each of them is $12.49 each. Okay, do I believe that these updates should be free? Absolutely not. I do not believe that the company has any responsibility whatsoever to give you those updates for free, because both games were sold to you in a complete state, with the exception of the Ranger mode, which I'm still salty about to this very day. The fact that they actually charge for that is a bit farcical, to say the least. But they were sold to you as complete games, and they were satisfying experiences. I'd say Last Light was easily one of my top games of last year. In fact, it was in my top games of last year list, and rightfully so. And the game wasn't missing anything glaringly obvious. So when Redux comes along, and you say, well, maybe those updates should be free, well, they could be, but real people worked on that for a very long time, and these are not bug fixes. Now, you could argue that the fixes to 2033, like the revamped AI, they could be considered bug fixes, but the AI wasn't that terrible. 
it was pretty bad, but it wasn't that terrible. It wasn't game-breakingly terrible. Some games just don't have as good AI as others, and it's worthy of criticism, but that doesn't mean that the company should go back and upgrade everything for free. I mean, where does that exactly end? I feel the responsibility of a game developer to a traditional title like this, which is sold in a box for full price, is to make sure that it's a bug-free experience, that everything works well, and that it gives a satisfying conclusion, and that it's a complete package. And honestly, both 2033 and Last Light were complete packages. So, one, I don't really have a problem with Redux coming along. It's going to be a reason for me to play 2033 again, because there were certainly some issues with that game, and I would like to see it running in the Last Light engine. Hopefully it will run better, and uh, it will give me an excuse to finish that, because I didn't get that far into it. And secondly, it gives me an excuse to revisit Last Light. The problem I have is the price tag, yeah? We were talking about the idea of free versus this current price tag. I don't think either of them are correct. I feel that the current price tag, even with the discount, is too much. Uh, I own both Metro Last Light and Metro 2033. $25 for the Redux bundle, which is basically two director's cuts. I would not pay for that, I don't think. I think that's a little bit too much, especially for Last Light. Last Light was already very good, and it's not like they're upgrading the engine. 2033 is a bit easier to swallow because it is an upgraded engine and they've put a lot of new mechanics into it, but, oh, Last Light, that's hard to justify. I think the only way you can really get around it is to say, well, it also comes with the DLC, but frankly, a lot of the DLC for that game isn't actually that good anyway. I feel that the price tag should be lower. I think there should be a deeper discount. I think 75% is reasonable. I think the improvements to Last Light could have been offered as a DLC pack. For 2033, no. I mean, they're completely porting the damn thing into a new engine. That's a new game in and of itself. But for Last Light in particular, I think that that could be a lot cheaper. Maybe leave 2033 at that price tag. I think that's more justifiable. But bring Last Light down, and that will also bring the price of the bundle down. We should bear in mind, of course, that the only reason Redux really exists is because they are targeting next-gen consoles. And if they didn't release these improvements on PC, there would be an outcry. They are giving people what they want. And we've seen this time and again when DLC has come to one platform and not another. There have been people that have complained, and rightfully so, that they don't get the same experience. So I, I'm okay with these existing. I'm entirely fine with that. And of course, upgrading things for next-gen consoles, especially considering the 360 and PS3 versions didn't hold a candle to the PC version. It's good that they get the better experience. But a bit too pricey, I think, for existing owners, and hopefully that's something that they reconsider. All right, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox, and I will see you next time. Delightful. Who is this charming rogue? Slain the parasite. An ally has been slain. An enemy has been slain. An enemy has been slain. And we cut back to our An ally has been slain.
make me look bad. The enemy has been shut down. Thank <laughs> you. 